Welcome to the second panel of today's seminar session. Uh, I'm Leonard Benarek. I'm the regional planner for the Bicycle Coalition. Uh, I have been on staff here for about a year and a half, and I am the Bicycle Coalition's first full-time employee that deals only with the suburbs, uh, as far as suburban roads and suburban roadway connections for cyclists and pedestrians. And I also work on the circuit trails, which is our 800-mile network of uh, off-road trails that are paved and multi-use, and both in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, this is our panel today. We're going to be talking about e-bikes, uh, the capacity that they have to change our transportation networks, and a lot of other things. Let's get right to it. Uh, first, a few words about the Bicycle Coalition. We've been in business uh, for since 1972, believe it or not. Uh, it was actually before I was born. And it went from a very small organization um, of people who really had to make a lot of noise and disruption to get attention uh, to an organization that today, we sort of have a seat at the table. We get invited by the city. We get invited by the county agencies to meet with them and talk about the bike network throughout the region. And that has been uh, through years of building up our membership and having our members go to meet with legislators uh, and through a series of wins that we've had, some that we had to do due, due to protests. We had a die-in on the Walnut Street Bridge in the 90s, if folks might remember that, to make sure that a bike lane would continue across the bridge when it got built or redecked. Uh, but most notably, uh, and in my opinion, the biggest advocacy win we've had in our history is the speed camera bill. This is a bill that is, was passed by a Republican legislature, led by a Republican legislator from Northeast Philadelphia, to add speed cameras to all of Roosevelt Boulevard. So not just a red light camera at a few intersections that people learn how to behave at, but speed cameras that will blanket every mile of Roosevelt Boulevard and bring people back to the speed limit. For those who don't know, Roosevelt Boulevard is our most dangerous roadway in Pennsylvania. Uh, it accounts for between 15 and 20 deaths a year. Um, most of those deaths are pedestrians who are attempting to get across the road. Uh, this will have a dramatic difference and an immediate difference on the safety of our roads, and we're hoping to be able to build on that by adding speed cameras to other areas of the city that where vulnerable users are, like in front of schools or in front of senior centers. So hopefully this is just the beginning, but it was a multi-year effort and so many trips to Harrisburg to get this speed camera bill uh, done. We're, we're really proud that that managed to happen. But let's talk about e-bikes. So just to give you a, a very general sense of what an e-bike is, um, the, the most common way to classify them are by these three classifications. So class one, which is the kind of bike we're looking at here, is a pedal assist bike. That means you can't just twist a throttle and make it go. It only works when you're working, and it is limited to 20 miles an hour. Uh, class two has a throttle assist. This is kind you might see uh, delivery people using a lot, where they're not really moving their pedals and they're just kind of scooting around the city. Um, and so that you can just twist a throttle and go. And class three has pedal assist, but it allows you to go up to 28 miles an hour. Uh, on this, this class of bike is usually not allowed on bike trails. Um, sometimes they're not even allowed in bike infrastructure and they're treated legislatively more like a motorcycle. Uh, so that's fine, but where exactly are your bikes allowed? So I'm, I'm our regional planner, so I decided to call the uh, the different, uh, send an email out to our different county planners uh, to ask them, what's your policy for e-bikes on your county trails, on your circuit trail network? And this is the answer I got back. <laughs> I don't know, you tell me. Uh, or, uh, we're working on it, we're developing a policy. But right now these bikes are out here, um, and they're way ahead of the, the policy, which, which often happens with any technology, like we see with uh, ride hailing, for example. It starts, uh, creates a huge problem, then a, then a, a backlash happens, then legislative uh, legislature comes in. Right now, e-bikes are coming in, there, there isn't really a huge backlash, but there are some issues happening, and legislators are sort of trying to, to catch up with the industry. Uh, I just want to give you a brief idea, since I am a planner, I kind of can't help myself but to give you a regional mapping geography wonky thing. Uh, this gives you an idea of the difference that e-bikes can make in our regional transportation network. So this is one line of our regional rail system. This is the river line in Camden, New Jersey. Has anyone ridden this? 
Well, you folks are, have had a treat and everybody else is missing out. They have bike racks in every car. Bikes are allowed 24 hours a day or all the time that the train is running. Uh, there's, so there's no work time restrictions and it is packed with bikes at all times. And these are workaday folks getting to their jobs. Uh, these are, this is not a sort of recreational amenity. Uh, but, so this is the river line and you can see this is Camden City down here and this is Trenton up here. It takes you all the way for about a buck 65 to Trenton. It's the best deal in our region. Uh, this is the walk ship. So how far can someone be reasonably expected to walk to the stations? That hasn't really improved access to transit very much unless you don't own a car. Well, so let's put in bikes. That's much better. That's a three mile buffer in New Jersey. It's very flat. That's a reasonable distance for even a beginning cyclist to be able to, to travel to get to work. What if that person owned an e-bike? What you have, this out here, this is farm country. You have people that live in farm country that would be able to bike to work in Camden or in Trenton. So that's, and to give you an idea of our region, this is our entire region. There's the river line right over here. Uh, there's our regular bike shed. That, that really improves access to our rail network. The e-bike shed gives us almost our entire region, farm country in Chester County, places that no one would ever think that you could live and not own one car for every single adult who lives in the house. You can do that with an e-bike. So that's the kind of transformation that can happen, but we're at the very, very early stages of what's going on with you guys. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Enrico Frizon from Willie or Tristino. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. We're going to have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. I'm running a pretty tight ship time-wise. So uh, we'll, please hold your questions to the end. If you need to write them down, please do so. And then we'll have lots of time, and you will go first, I promise, when we have the, uh, the audience Q&A. But Enrico is going to be here to tell us about their new e-road bike, which is this bike here. It's like an e-bike in disguise. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. It's very sexy. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Enrico Frison from Villa Tristina. We are uh, an Italian company. And we sponsor several, several teams, uh, both in Giro d'Italia and Tour de France. So we have a deep knowledge on racing bicycles, and we are keen on new technologies. It's for this reason that we developed a new e-road bike, that is this one that you see. And it's a really new concept of bike, because uh, it's, the geometries are the same of our racing bicycles, but there is an electric system that is hidden inside the frame. So the battery is placed in the down tube, and is connected with a, a motor, an electric motor placed in the rear hub. And the battery is also connected with a charging point and a speed sensor in the rear dropout. Uh, and the battery is also connected to the button on the top tube. And through the, uh, this button, you can select the, uh, the level assistance that you want, up to three levels. And then you can see the charger of the battery. So, as you see, the bike is a really normal bike. Uh, uh, our, the, result, the main result is the, the weight. In fact, this bike weighs just 11.9 uh, kilos. And uh, the maximum speed that uh, you can reach with this bike is 20 miles per hour. After this limit, you have to pedal again, and you can reach also fa uh, faster velocity. And also, there, are, there is a, an American version and an European version. Also, in accordance with the regulation, you can reach different values of velocities. And to make the motor work, you must pedal. Otherwise, uh, uh, the motor doesn't, doesn't stop. So, the electric system developed uh, is uh, made by a battery in the down tube. It has a capacity of 250 watt hours. And then this battery is uh, connected with a motor in the rear hub. The, this motor has a maximum torque of 40 newton per meter. And also there is a, this button that we call iWalk. Through this button, you can select the level assistance, the charge of the battery, and there is the pass sensor. The pass sensor works in this way. The free wheel of the, of the bike has a magnet lock ring and through the rotation of this, uh, of this magnet, this speed, the, the speed sensor can understand the velocity of the bike 
and regulate the power of the motor in accordance with the speed. So this is the lightest, the lightest solution on the market. There are other competitors, but the, the solution of the other competitors are different. So <coughs> as you see in this slide, you can see the, the, the battery in the down tube, the pass sensor on the top tube, the charging coil in the, in the bottom bracket, the pass sensor in the rear dropout, and the, the motor placed in the rear part. Okay, so if you want to, to ride your bike, you can use it as a normal bike, just select your level assistance through the bottom. But if you want to, to have a greater interaction with the, with the bike, you can download this application. It's called a bike motion. You can go to Google Store or uh, an Apple Store and decide this. You can decide to download this application and have a greater interaction. Through this application, you can pair the bike with your smartphone, see the speed of the bike, the velocity, the, the charge of the battery, but also you can have a greater interaction. You can set some options on this bike. For example, you, you can decide uh, some navigation system options. Uh, you can have a look on the last position that you place uh, where you place your bike. And the most important function that you can have with this bike is that you can pair your bike with your smartphone and with a heart rate monitor bed. So if you want to reach a maximum value of a heart rate, you just put this value on the smartphone, for example, 150 uh, pumps per minute. And if you reach this value, the battery automatically put powers on the motor. And it allows you to decrease your heart rate and could be useful for all old people maybe that had surgery on the way, on the heart. And yeah, could be helpful for this, this client. Okay, then if you want to have a post-training view, you can return back to, to your home. Uh, tape on Google www.t.bikemotion.com and see a lot of information about your bike and about your activities. For example, you can see the time that you ride your bike, uh, all, your, all the activities that you have done. You can see also the charts of, the, of your riding. And then there you see, uh, you see in the, the lower corner, you can see the altitude of your ride riding, the speed, the, your heart rate, and also the, uh, the value of the motor power. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Oh, that's a little bit. My name is Kimberly Bezak. And I'm just here to tell a story today about how e-biking changed my family's life. So, in 2007, I was living in New Orleans, which is where I'm from, dating my husband, and we started using a bike to get around. Parking our car on the street in New Orleans was not a fun experience, and moving it and finding a parking spot again was definitely not a fun experience. So we started using our bikes to get around to work. We'd go to the grocery on the weekends. We'd bike to Jazz Fest and different festivals in New Orleans. Then when we started a family, it wasn't as realistic to get around on a regular bike. So fast forward to 2014. We were living in Washington, DC, trying to do it going the car to get around for local stuff and my regular bike with a bike seat and the basket on the front and bungeeing a Costco bag to the back to get grocery shopping done was not cutting it anymore. So my husband was nudging, nudging, nudging and I finally said, okay, fine, let's get a cargo bike. So this is us. Well, this is my now going on seven-year-old daughter, Ava, at the Washington Monument for 4th of July. And transitioning to the cargo bike really let us 
continue to forego the car and get around for local um, family outings and errands in Washington, D.C. We were out exploring the trails on the weekends and just really having a really rich experience living in D.C. and not having to get in the car. So then we moved to Philadelphia. And I was pregnant. We were living in Manions. Not sure how familiar folks are with Manions, but it's very hilly. And I was pregnant, and one day I could not get to the library with our cargo bike and my two-year-old. I called my husband crying. He had been nudging me, saying, let me put an e-assist on the bike. So I finally gave in. We added an assist. And I was now able to continue cargo biking while pregnant. Um, it allowed us to continue to forego the use of a car for local transportation, all things local, really. And then this picture right here is on Belmont Plateau with a newborn Alexa in the car seat and then my daughter Ava. So, we continue to forego use of a car for local stuff. This is on the left here, a okay, let me use this laser. This is the Pencoid Bridge. And this is Forbidden Drive. This is the Kinwood Heritage Trail, which is part of the circuit trail system. And we brought a few friends along for the ride. That's my husband. Um, we now live in Narberth, just outside the city. And it's really hilly um, out in Penn Valley, my daughter's school. And because we have the e-cargo bike, we were able to participate in this year's Bike to School Day. We brought a friend along. And again, just a snapshot into my story of how we're really using the cargo bike now in the suburbs, in addition to Philadelphia, just to get around for everything. The uh, top picture here was a bike ride to go get ice cream with a friend. And the bottom picture, I biked my girls to my mother-in-law's house for a sleepover at Nana's. Again, a few more examples of how e-cargo biking really has changed our family life. We're now foregoing using the car within 10 miles of our house on a regular basis. Uh, this is biking to the Belmont Hill Pool. This is, we biked all the way to Citizens Bank Park from Narberth earlier this year for a Phillies game. And then donation drop-off. So living in Narber, a family came to me and said, you know, you're setting such a good example in the, in the community with cargo biking. We really admire the fact that you're getting around in such a sustainable way. Why don't you start a bicycle club? I said, OK. I thought 30 people would join our club at the most. And yesterday, I added our 356th member to our club in Narberth. We've only been around for a year and a half. Um, but every Monday, something really cool that we're doing is I lead a ride to groceries. Again, there's a mom here, Carrie, over in the back. I was leaving school, the preschool on Mondays, and she said, can I bike along with you one day to Trader Joe's? And I said, you know what, let's make it a group ride and see if anyone shows up. We have like 11, 12, 15 people on a Monday morning that ride to Trader Joe's with me. Trader Joe's gets worried if they don't see us now on Mondays. <laughs> um, but again, earlier this year when I started these rides in February, I was the only cargo bike in Narberth. And now, as you can see from this picture, the cargo bike movement is growing in the suburbs. People are using it as a car replacement. Um, I think last count there were 10 not just the Madsen, but 10 cargo bikes in the suburbs. Several of them have now done it e-assisted. And we're biking year-round. Um, and then one last thing back here. My mother-in-law on her trike. She uses it for balance. She's been able to ditch the car and use the trike for all things local. And again, she, she needed that confidence to know that she could climb the hills around our, our town. So she added the e-assist to her trike, and now she's biking into the city with me. We're biking to Manion. She's doing the grocery shopping. So she's in her 60s, and she's e-triking all around the suburbs, really setting a great example.
So again, Narver Cycling Club, if you want to learn more about us, thank you so much. Next up is Meenal Rapal from Philly Electric Wheels. Hello and thanks for having me here today. For us, it, for us, it all started in 2009 when I wanted to make a daily trip to Germantown from Mount Area to check on temperatures on a dozen compost piles. The two-mile trip required me to take two buses and it took over 45 minutes, so I kept reaching for our one family car twice a day. Well, this soon became contentious. And with the threat of buying a second car, you know, the, the expense, the carbon emissions, some quick research led me to purchase an e-bike from out of state. Why out of state? Because no bike shop in our region carried a selection of these at the time. Um, this one purchase um, converted me, a non-cyclist, to a cycling advocate. I ended up in Harrisburg with Alex Doty to talk about e-bike uh, with PennDOT. And within months, um, the funds that would have gone into paying for a Prius outright went to start FEW, Philly Electric Wheels, in a boutique space with a half a dozen new e-bikes. Uh, having never bought a bike over $300, we tried to keep the price point of our new e-bike between $500 and $1,500. Um, having never run a bike shop, it took customers coming to us asking for tubes, helmets, chain breakers, and chains for us to end up stocking all of these. Um, coming to the cycling world from the transport perspective, we never felt the need to stock up on cycling-specific apparel because I'd never go to dinner, to meetings, to moms, etc., looking like that. Um, it could be the cooperative spirit of Mount Airy, but competitive cycling never appealed to us either, so any inquiries about road bikes were sent to other neighboring shops. Um, by year three, we tried open shop nights, dubbing them Thrifty Thursdays, after people began asking us about how to do some basic bike repairs. Despite a few fun nights, we found ourselves just working late or hanging out our, by ourselves over a beer. Um, all, all alone, so soon we stopped this endeavor too. Another request from customers has been electric scooters, you know, the ones that look like, like, like motorcycles. Though we've repaired a number of these, we will not stock these. In our opinion, these are not e-bikes. Um, so we are um, into our 10th year. At our current location for six years, uh, we sell e-bikes designed by the industry. Typically, they are class one and class three, as uh, was mentioned. Pedal assist with a max speed of 20 or 28 miles an hour. We also have a decent, I could say, the largest selection in the region of folding bikes. A line we only considered upon customer request. And we are um, known as a go-to place for all e-bike repairs, whether we sold them or not, um, including the ones that are purchased online with no support whatsoever. Um, Uh, recently, with numerous repair, uh, requests to open up on Sundays and Mondays, or to open up earlier before people went to work or to remain later in the evening, um, this fall we decided to transition from being a retailer to being a professional services space. So we're open by appointment or by chance. It's working out quite well so far. It helps us stage uh, how many people end up at our shop. Um, Uh, well, the one category that people come from out of state now um, um, and travel distances are custom e-bikes. Um, we've converted countless uh, standard bikes, um, hybrids and mountain bikes, to e-bikes. Initially, uh, it's been e-bike kit with the rear hub motor or bionics with also with the rear hub motor and more currently with the Bafang mid-drive motors. Uh, e each of these have allowed us to program the assist levels for each customer, um, selecting the components. Um, we've also enjoyed the unusual builds, the tandems, the cargo bikes, and the recumbents. Um, I'm gonna interject that there's a class four that was not mentioned. 
uh, which is pedal assist and throttle. And um, again, industry is only selling pedal assist bikes and people come to us for the choice of having both. Um, there's also a lot of e-bike companies that have gone out of business and that's that Revive Orphan e-bikes. We still service and support them. Um, if you have one, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the future, let's see. Um, feeling like we know the business a little bit, what could the future be for e-bikes? Uh, one frustration has been the batteries. Oftentimes, um, they're um, different casing for different bikes, but what goes wrong is a couple of cells inside the bikes. Uh, so like we're used to the AA and the AAA batteries, it would be great if there were standard swappable battery cells um, developed by the industry. Another idea we've had for a long time is for the city to consider our bike shop as infrastructure, um, highlighted on street signage. Uh, not just where the retail uh, uh, shops are or the train stations are, but also where the closest bike shop could be. Um, another way the, our city could support bike shops uh, would be to have uh, some kind of subsidy or support to have bike shops at every train station and bus people that could offer same day quick repairs. Um, that'll get more people on a bike, I think. Thank you. Um, hi, I, I'm, uh, my name is Paul Baskin. I'm, I live down in the D.C. area, and um, I'm a, I've been a daily bike commuter for like the last 10 years or so, actually more than that, but 10, at least 10 years. Um, mostly it's been about a 10-mile ride from my place just outside of D.C. to downtown, and um, I go along um, a, a route generally along the Capitol Crescent Trail, for anyone who knows what that is. And um, it's about, for me, it's about a five-minute ride or so to get to the trail, and then about a five-minute ride to get off the trail. Um, those are both on car roads, and then the trail part is maybe about seven miles or so that I, that I get on. And um, so the deal is that, I, I mean, I've, I've written about this a little bit. Um, Leonard saw me on a panel on this same subject in D.C. about half a year ago or so. And, um, and I've, been, I've been thinking about this because what, you know, on, on the trail, on the Cap Crescent Trail where I ride, um, there are, you can see these, these uh, motorized bikes, is what I call them. Um, I call them motorized bikes. I, I'm not sure. But the, the term e-bike, in my mind, um, I, I heard there was one reference to an e-bike in disguise. I mean, that, that kind of rings true with me because the whole term actually is, is disguise. Um, what they are is motorized bikes. And um, they used to be called mopeds, actually, a while, you know, a few years ago, uh, maybe decades ago. And then they became slowly more and more motorized and people sort of stopped, stopped calling them mopeds because you know, there was nobody pretending to pedal them anymore. They were basically motorcycles. So we seem to be repeating the cycle again. Um, so now the new way to call it is, is an e-bike for a while, and then we'll see what it actually ends up being called after a while. Um, but, but um, you know, one thing, um, Leonard made the, the comment, others have said the same thing, that there's a distinction between a class one and a class two. The class one, I guess, has, the, has more of the pretense of pedaling, and, the, and the, or the other way around, I guess the class two has more of the pretense of pedaling. But there's nothing in the law, really, that requires you to, to pedal it of any certain amount. So it's, it's, a, it's a really nonsensical distinction, that, 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 that the purpose of which... Um, you can decide for yourselves what, what's what's really what's really being going going after here. Um, I, I think they're fine. If people want to ride them. That's fabulous. I, I Kimberly's story is, is terrific. I, I just I think that's what she's doing sounds marvelous. Um, one thing that wasn't discussed in her presentation um, was where she's riding it, whether she's riding it on, on car on, on motorized roads or on trails. And that's really the, for me the, the key question with these things. And it's a question that really seems to be glossed over a lot constantly in these discussions, and um, you know, they, they like to emphasize the term e-bike as, as, if, as if we don't have motorized you know, electric, electric cars and electric motorcycles. I mean, you can, if, you want, if, you want to, if you want to use an electric vehicle, that's fabulous, much better than, than a gas-powered vehicle. Um, but why that somehow gives you the right to put it on a, on, a, on a bike trail is not quite clear to me and to a lot of people that I know that ride on, that ride on trails. Um, so, uh, and, and especially, the, I mean, the other thing, I mean, so, so, you, so maybe it's Kimberly might, if we asked her, I assume we'd say maybe she sometimes puts it on a, on a, on a trail too, for, you know, because that's where she feels safer. And that really sort of gets to the key point, I think, is, is why, what, what are we achieving by, by putting motors on our trails? Are we, making, are we making that safer? 
what's, what's really happening is that what's making it safer for everybody in the long term is to, is to basically get rid of any place where we can ride a bicycle without a motor around us. Is that what's sort of in the overall best interest of our as a society is to, is to essentially get rid of any place you can ride a bicycle without a motor around you? Um, and more to the point, I guess, is even if you, if you really did have people who really needed it for some circumstance, one, why, if they need a motor, there's plenty of places to ride a motorized vehicle. I mean, we're not lacking for those in our society. As a matter of fact, that's, in fact, probably, probably too much of the problem is there's too many places you can ride a motorized vehicle around. And so now the idea is apparently to take that away and, um, and, put, and put it on, our, on the few areas we don't have. Um, then the question is, why 20 miles an hour? If it, was, if it was really necessary to help people out who just can't pedal, and that's a real thing, um, but do they, do they really need to, or would they be safe going 20 miles an hour? And what does that do then to the people who just want to bike at a normal bike speed, which is about 12 miles an hour? Um, so so that's, that's really, I think, what I'm getting at. Is I'm, if, if, if e-bikes or motorized bikes, you want to sell them and people want to ride them on car roads, that's great. But the question of whether it's a sort of just sort of smoothly assume, therefore, that they belong on bike trails and that bike trails essentially should no longer exist where, where you don't have a bike trail, it's just a bike trail or, or a bike and pedestrian trail. That seems to be a question that really is not getting looked at a lot in this discussion. That's, that's really what, I, what I'm trying to bring out. And, um, and I, 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 my, my sense is that if, remember we even had this at the last conference we were at, we talked about this question, we had an industry person on and asked them why the 20 miles an hour, and they, they've given different reasons, but when it really came down to it, his answer was um, because that's, that's what the market demands. Essentially that the reason what you're trying to do and why you're trying to disguise the fact that that's really a motorized bike is because you want to put them on trails and therefore give people an opportunity to put, put a motor on a place where a motor is not allowed because it's not safe to, to ride because you don't feel safe riding with other motors. And you know that's because of the way, you know, a lot of, a lot, not everybody certainly, but a lot of people with motors will behave, which is when, they're, when, you have a, when you have a motor around somebody who doesn't have a motor. I just was, bike, was walking here from the train station this morning and I saw an example of what I see every day, which was a guy riding his bike down 19th Street. He was trying to cross market and he was in the middle lane and a car just came flying up on the side of him you know, at full speed, probably 20 or 30 miles an hour, would not even let him go over to the side. That's, that's it's a mentality. It's, it's, what, it's, what you, it's, what, it's, a, it's, it's a mentality you get with power for a vehicle. And, and, and the, the basic idea here is to put them on our trails and essentially end what, what, what a trail right now is. Um, so I, I mean, I had some photos here which I can send you, but I mean, the, the, the law essentially is, is 20 miles an hour and up to three wheels and, and um, no real size restrictions. So I mean, they, there's pictures, I think, of here are some of what these look like. I mean, these are, I mean, th this is, um, this, this, this is one, I mean, that's, that's, that's legal under the law that they're putting, that would be legal on the trail, and a lot of ones like that, as long as you make it up to 20 miles an hour. You can put, you can basically put a whole, well, I guess that's, yeah, I think he's moved on to his. At that point, but that's you can you can um, three wheels twenty miles an hour on the trails. That's the law. Now, if you want if you want something different, then then you need to be aware that's the law that's being pushed right now to get up to, to make legal on trails. And um, good, good luck with what that will look like on our trails. We'll we'll still have them anymore after that. Happens. Thank you. So uh, okay, so I think I think we have your attention. Uh, this is normally the part of a panel where the panelist, the, the moderator, has a series of thoughtful questions that they've worked on the night before, um, and that person didn't have a crying toddler waking them up several times in the middle of the night and so forth. But I also realized uh, you guys probably have some questions for each other, so um, why don't we just go with that format as well, because I think that might be better to hear from the, the two sides of, uh, of the argument. We at the Bicycle Coalition don't have as much of a sort of dog in this fight. Um, we are generally supportive of e-bikes, but we're, we're waiting to see sort of where the dust settles behind all the uh, regulation. So, uh, and I'd just like to remind everyone that we're all cycling advocates here. We're all roughly on the same, we agree about 90% probably in terms of the broad spectrum of cycling, and this is the 10% the where we might differ. Oh, yeah, I'm, um, you, I, I guess the mic's kind of I mean, actually, super That's a question for the audience, maybe. <laughs> well, we'll have time for audience questions. <laughs> okay. So, a couple of things I would like to say, just to follow up to what Paul said, because 
you know, we have very different views of what e-bikes can be for communities. You know, the example that you might have two e-bikes on a trail breaking the law and going 28 miles per hour, so therefore e-bikes shouldn't be allowed on trails. It's kind of like saying, I, on my way here today, I saw two cars speeding down the street in Narber. So no cars should be allowed to use the street. It's kind of the association I'm making there. You know, e-bikes e are pedal assist. The bikes that we're talking about today. I canceled my gym membership because I get a workout. Even though my bike helps me get up that hill and helps me go those extra two miles when I've got four kids in the back, I'm still doing a lot of work to get around. In, in an e-car, no one's doing any work to get around. Um, so my thought around this is that the pedal assist is going to get people out of cars that are polluting the earth, and they're going to get them on the bike. They're going to be more healthy. It's a much more sustainable approach to local transportation rather than using the car to go the mile. Um, I do ride my bike on trails. I do ride my bike on the street. I feel very comfortable on the street. I'm a confident road user on a bike, even with my kids in the back. Um, the trail aspect is part of the greater regional connectivity, the transportation, bike transportation connectivity. I leave my house. I bike down to the Kenwood Trail. I hop over Pankoid Bridge. I take Schuylkill River Trail down into the city all the time. Um, so I do feel very comfortable on both. You even have groups like the American Diabetes Association saying e-bikes is getting people off of their couch and onto trails. The people that felt very intimidated about going on the Kenwood Trail and doing those couple of climbs that were kind of uncomfortable, they're now getting on a bike, using the assist to climb that hill, and then going about their way. The assist is not 100% on, 100% off type of thing. Um, you know, the other thing is when I am on the trail using my e-bike, people are buzzing past me. You know, my top speed, eight, 10 miles per hour, the lycra-clad lycra crew is certainly buzzing past me. Um, maybe when I'm on a hill, you know, I'm keeping up with people. But for the most part, I'm not the speed demon going 28 miles per hour, just like the majority of us aren't speeding on the streets. So, thanks. I think Paul's been writing pretty furiously, so it's like he's ready to respond. It's some of it seem to be addressed. So I'll, I'll, I'll take on some of that. Um, in no particular order, um, the American Diabetes Association, is that what you said? What, I'm, not, I'm not sure what they know about the trade-off on a trail, but I would ask it this way. Is there a study that shows how what the overall health, um, net, the net gain or loss of health will be if we put motors on trails and then people, yeah, some people maybe use them who wouldn't, but how, about, how about the people who are scared off a trail because they're like, oh my God, there's now a bunch of motorists going 20 miles an hour up and on the trail. I mean, what, what study data tells you that that will be a net gain in American health? You only need 30 minutes of activity for an increased health. So it's not a, you don't need a lot of activity out there. That's not what I asked. I, what I asked was, what's the, net, what's the net gain in health you get from putting a bunch of 20 mile an hour motors on the trails and potentially scaring off people who are using it now? That's what I asked. It will get people that don't get on a bike. I'm just, I believe, well, you're just saying your theory. I'm asking, is there a data that shows that? Or is that just your, that's your theory and I can have mine? It's nine years of business experience. I have tons of customers. And I'm ready for some audience questions. Yeah, please. okay. The other thing I'd say, the other thing I'd just say is, uh, I'd ask is, if, if you don't need to go 20 miles an hour, then would you be happy with a law that said you could go on a trail that the that limit was 12, 12 miles an hour, the average speed of a trail user? I have no issue with speed limits on trails. In my experience, people are not riding e-bikes and going 20 miles, 20 miles per hour on trails. A lot of this conversation is fear-mongering, um, unfortunately, and you know, e-bikes is helping breaking down barriers to biking, and if we don't allow a little bit of inclusion, we're, we're just reinforcing barriers. Mm -hmm. Bicycling has been, in America, has this reputation as lycra, racing, recreation, 
and you've got a lot of people that are interested in using the bike for everyday things. Um, so. Oh, okay. I, 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 I've, I've spoken about a quarter. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say you have a moment to respond, and then I think it'd be good to. No. No. It'd be good to have a chance to hear. Just hands up. Let's yes. see. Indeed. We have about 20 minutes left, and I see a lot of eager hands coming up. Uh, you, sir, in the back here. Uh, well, I'm probably not the microphone. I fall on Steve. I live in D.C. I ride the Capitol Crescent Trail. So just a couple of things to say. I think this issue about speed, it's the tyranny of the fast, okay? I was reading on one of our local listservs, a racer complaining that when I was riding up the hill from the Key Bridge in Arlington, some e-bike zoomed past me, and I was startled to see that happen. I said, you know, dude, you've probably been startling people for years and years. Okay. So that, that's the first thing that I wanted to say. The, the second thing is that <clears throat> I fall uh, Capitol Crescent Trail in Montgomery County, 15 mile an hour speed limit. We both agree that should be enforced. But I think the point that a lot of people were making on the dais here is, look, there's only a few of us in this room, the demographics kind of tending to be, you know, over 40, and we need more infrastructure. If we don't get more critical mass, and that's really going to happen from e-bikes, we won't then be able to have the Capitol Crescent Trail preserved as a place where you can have that 15 mile an hour speed. So that's my comment. Uh, well, I just want to... Um suggest that there's no real conflict uh, with respect to the value of introducing more environmentally friendly modes of transportation for all kinds of purposes. But I do think that the issue of whether this is going to be legislated in a way that encourages or discourages that is something that should be taken up. And this is, uh, as I said in my intro, it's something that the county planners are still working out. Uh, National Park Service has a policy that e-bikes are not allowed on any of their trails. And depending on where you go, you could find yourself uh, on the wrong side of the law and not even know it right now, or um, be operating in a, in a sort of gray area. We got, I got an email from one of our members who's sitting here up front who asked for some clarity, and that's when I went and, and asked the county planners and expected, oh, well, our policy is this. Uh, they're, still, they're still crafting it. So yeah, the, the law is sort of catching up with what people are already doing. Uh, sir, I think you've had your hand up for a while from the previous panel as well. Uh, yeah, change. but th this will be in regards to the e-bikes. Um, regulating them on the trails, are we also going to be regulating the Lime and Bird scooters since those are motorized vehicles as well? Because being a standard cyclist from Baltimore and riding through D.C. as well, those scooters are quick. Um, and I would almost call those more of an issue than e-bikes because it's easier to fall over on a scooter than it is a bike. Typically, if you're on a bike, you know how to control yourself, um, especially when you're carrying four children in your cart, which I actually have a question on that. How much can you carry? <laughs> what is the power, towing Water capacity pounds. of those things? Okay. Um, 171 kilograms. It's, yeah. it's printed on the side of the bucket. I couldn't believe it. 600 That's... pounds I can carry. I can carry more kids in my bike than, my, than our one car, and it has a 600-pound carrying capacity. Following up on that, how much does the motor assist when you're having that thing full? Because I'm expecting like that's a lot of pressure on your legs to pedal or just a standard person. How much does the motor, the pedal assist, if you will, because it's a pedal assist, uh, kick in when you're carrying a full load or a load in general? Yeah, it's, hard. it's a hard question to answer because with pedal assist, you get four to five levels of assistance. Yeah. So you can do the minimum, which is why I major use the majority of the time, which is level one. And when I'm climbing a bridge or a really hard hill climb, it just kind of feels like someone's behind you with their hand, like giving you an extra little push. Um, level two gives you a little more nudge, a level three, you know. So it, it I've been doing it long enough now that I kind of have an idea, okay, I've got four kids in the back, I should probably bump it up a little more um, versus like a regular. So going on that, you're saying that you can control the speed of your motor. <laughs> yes, absolutely. From a normal bike to a full-fledged motor, well not motorized, but pedal-assisted yep. vehicle. So, so if you wanted, you could turn it off. Level yes. zero, 
is me doing all yeah. the work. Yes. Level one, I'm getting that little bit of nudge, um, especially uh, when I'm stopped on a hill, getting going from a stop sign. It's really hard to get going under a load when you've got 400 pounds on your bike. Um, and yeah, you can totally manage the speed. I mean, my top speed when I'm coming down a hill, I get uncomfortable if I'm over like 15, 17. You know, I'm really catching, like under a load especially, yeah. you really pick up speed. But. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, um, I can say a lot, and I can ride a lot, and um, I think bikes are very dangerous to other bikes. It's really true. Um, but I just got back from Israel a few months ago. And nothing we're talking about is about what's going on in Tel Aviv right now. <clears throat> there are hundreds of scooters, electric bikes, on roads, pathways, even on sidewalks, which is a little, really crazy. Um, and I mean, people are riding traditionally on these same things being passed by these little e-bikes all the time, which people aren't pedaling on. It's just, it is somewhat chaotic, but it's, it's working there, although it's clear they can use some more regulation. But um, that's what's going to happen, because there's no doubt that what's happening there, just because that's the nature of society there, um, it's going to catch up here. Um, and you can't believe how much electricity are on the roads there right now. Um, and so I, and I think, I really think that the coalition can't take a passive view about this. You've got governments, you're working with governments. Things have to be done like speed limits, um, you know, separated paths where there's enough width to really start to control this. Um, and the governments are not going to respond very well on their own. Um, and, and the coalition really needs to, it's a hard work, but to really take a hold of this and give them some guidance. Well, to be clear, we are having, we have a pretty active role with the city. We helped um, Councilman Scuola draft legislation that is paving the way to regulate e-scooters. Because right. inevitably, Lyme and Bird will arrive. And they've, and they've done this in other cities without permitting. They've just shown up. Uh, and we encourage the city to adopt regulation that enables them to write very specific uh, legislation that enables them to write very specific legislation about how to regulate e-scooters and where they can be used where they can be parked and all this. So we've been a part of that conversation. I think where we, what I meant where we don't have a dog in this fight is, uh, I, I hear merits in, in Paul's conversation and I hear merits in, in Kimberly and Minal's perspective. I'm a cargo bike user myself. I ride with my kids. Uh, I've been sort of contemplating getting an e-bike modification for my bike as well, but we don't uh, have a position as to whether or not they belong on trails or not yet. Um, and. We're not, we're not going to advocate if, if Montgomery County says e-bikes don't belong on trails, well then we might want to have a discussion with them about uh, some of the experiences of some of our members who use trails as their transportation network, not just as a, as a recreational network. And I think also, you know, Kimberly raised some, some good points in that, you know, there are people who, you know, uh, Paul, part of your presentation was the e-bike can be modified and a lot of people hack their bike and you tell the computer that what you have is not a 27-inch wheel, but you have a 20-inch wheel, which then changes the speed limit from 20 to 40 miles an hour. And that's done relatively <coughs> easily to almost any e-bike platform. But that's not much different than somebody putting nitrous on their car and going drag racing on Roosevelt Boulevard. It's like we, uh, we kind of need to, we need to regulate those people who, who are making those modifications. Anyway, uh, sir, you had your hand up in the back. Uh, just as, as a 55-year-old guy, someone who probably could hit, you know, back in the day, 30 miles an hour on flats and be speeding, and who is now considering an e-bike because I've had torn my meniscus a couple times, I just uh, struggle on some things. This seems more like a question, I've, I'm struggling with the trail piece and what's wrong with having an e-bike because this seems more like a question of speed. And as long as there's enforcement on trails, which I know is hard to do, but if the, it's sort of an education and enforcement, just like on the roads and cars, then does it really matter if I'm getting a little push or not, as long, and then I'm starting to think, well, is there a noise aspect of, is it going boom, <laughs> right? But as long as it's quiet, does it really matter if, um, if I need a little bit of help as long as I'm riding at a safe speed of like 15, 12, 9, 18, 
whatever is appropriate for the trail based on the conditions of that trail. And I, I just, and there's, trust me, if I could, if I could ride without uh, assistance, I would. Um, my son is a, actually he's involved with the Bike Expo. He's a 25 year old professional triathlete and um, he's not going to need an e-bike. And I'd love to ride with him, but uh, I'm probably going to have to have a little motor or some sort of assistance to keep up with him. So, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still, I'm struggling with the argument. I'd love to, to well, understand it better. I'm agreeing with you. What I'm saying is that the, that the limit of 20 miles an hour is not appropriate. It's not what the average speed on the trail is. It's a completely different character. And the fact that it allows three wheels and up to any size, that picture I showed you, that's really what's legal on, on the trail. On the, well, you're not seeing it yet, but wait. If it's, if, it's, if it's what's legal, then wait to see what happens. And the other just fundamental question is this, this emphasis on e-bike, as if, as if we don't have e-cars and e-motorcycles. I mean, that, that's, not the, that's distracting from the question. The question is motors versus not motors. I mean, you can have, a different, you can have your own opinion on whether motors are motors, but at least, at least have that discussion. Don't pretend, don't pretend it's an e-bike versus a not e-bike discussion. Electric is everywhere, and hopefully and very soon, all cars will be electric and all motorcycles will be electric, and the difference is, is that's not the difference. The difference is, do we want motorized, motorized transit on the trails, and if so, at what, at what, altered, what motorized speed? That's the question. Uh, yeah, Mike, you've had your hand up. Um, I've been involved with the Chester Valley Trail, one of our significant trails in our circuit, since it opened in 2010. Until e bikes started to appear I'll, I'll roughly repeat. four years ago, the most common complaint that the park department, the rangers had, was excessive speed by bicyclists. If you go on the Schuylkill River Trail Saturday morning and you just stay there for 10 minutes, you will see pelotons going by, heading west out of town, at speeds exceeding 20 miles an hour. Non, a non e bike. Non-e-bike, non -e -bike. Most of you here own an automobile. You may not use it much, but it has the capability of going significantly faster than the speed limits on any of the roads in the Commonwealth. A bike, a speed limit on a trail should apply to all bikes, and there is speed limits. On the Chester Valley Trail, I believe the Schuylkill River Trail similarly has a 15 mile an hour speed limit. Unenforced. It is easily enforced with simple handheld radar devices. We bought them for our rangers on the Chester Valley Trail in the past six months. Uh, it's a question of the will and the effort to go in and do that. But the problem is not the e-bikes on the Chester Valley Trail. The problem is inconsiderate, inconsiderate behavior towards others. If everybody rides in a respectful manner, it doesn't matter whether they have e-assist or not. And that's the key thing. How do we enforce respectful behavior? It's not an easy thing. We can't do it on our roads. They're not a good example. They're a and so example. They're exactly the example. They're exactly the example. Go ahead. Well, it, it's, and why that's, are cars made with 120 mile an hour top speed or whatever? That, that's, when you, that's the issue. So I think it's, the key is respectful use of whatever motivate, whatever device you're using on the trail that is permitted on, in that particular environment, and I would hate to see us try and push e-bikes off of there because they do enhance the experience and bring people into the uh, environment out there getting them some exercise that wouldn't be there otherwise. Thank you. Mike did raise an interesting uh, uh, example. I wasn't aware that they were doing radar enforcement on the Chester Valley Trail. Just a fun fact, it is illegal for anyone to, any law enforcement agency in the Commonwealth to do radar enforcement except for state police. On the road. Illegal. Yeah. On, the road. On, on the road. On any, so <laughs> if they're issuing actual citations, they're no. operating in what I would no, call a gray area. It's used as an educational tool. Right, right. To raise that, awareness amongst users. They're not, uh, they have no intention of presence on right. of citing people. But well, like, that can change. Like Mike said and the other gentlemen that may have left, this is really creating that critical mass that we need to get the bike infrastructure going in the United States. Um, you know, 
if it's putting more people on bikes, if the gentleman that's 55 saying, you know, I'm not on my bike as much anymore, but maybe if I get that nudge, I'll get out on my bike and ride with my son. It's getting that critical mass out there that we need to get the funding, to get the infrastructure, to, to, to keep the, the momentum going. It's like back in the 90s when we heard about email, we were like, email? We have mail. It's like the same conversation right now. E-bikes, but we have bikes. Again, in a few years, it's, it's going to be an everyday. You won't even think twice about it, is, is my thought on it. This is like the very early stages, like Leonard said. And we're going to keep shaping it, keep the conversation going. And I think you'll see more people out enjoying the trails in a much more inclusive way. OK, I have uh, one, two, and then three, Okay, just to make sure everybody's in the queue. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I totally understand the like, need to have um, ski limits that are enforced on trails, but I just want to go back to what you two were saying. Like, if we frame this discussion about how to enforce those speed limits on trails in the form of e-bikes, it's just another type of gatekeeping. Um, cycling itself is not a very diverse sport. And when you start to, you know, not only, uh, when you start to have this exclusion of e-bikes, you start to say like, oh, well, who deserves to bike? Does somebody who is obese and wants to be more healthy, do they deserve to bike? Does somebody who was an athlete in their youth but has a debilitating injury now, do they deserve to bike? Um, so while these conversations are necessary, I don't think that we can have them framed as e-bikes versus analog bikes without enforcing those um, exclusions that have always existed in our sport. I just had a legislative question. I'm from New York State, so not from Pennsylvania. But right now in New York State, it's legal to sell an e-bike, but not legal to ride it. <laughs> and they're trying to push the basically a class one bike is the only legal e-bike in New York State. I was wondering in Pennsylvania, what's the legislation? Pennsylvania recognizes all, all, all three classes of e-bikes as um, it's like considered an other motorized vehicle, which is now sort of getting looped in with uh, e-scooters. So Pennsylvania definitely allows, um, well, every state allows e-bikes. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that even in New York, they would allow the others, but they would be treated as a motorcycle. We have really, uh, in New Jersey has what the People for Bikes Coalition would call troublesome regulation, in that any e-bike is considered the same as a moped. You have to have a driver's license, you have to, you know, you have to have a license plate and insurance and all these kind of things. This is why I'm sure Willier designed their bike, because when I heard e-road bike, I was like, I could go 50 miles an hour on my, on my road bike. And he's like, oh, pump the brakes. It's 20 miles an hour. This is just to help you get up the hills, because otherwise it's a motorcycle, which, which creates this, uh, this kind of issue. Yeah. Pennsylvania's uh, legislation in terms of the industry standpoint is that it's like pretty good. There's a handful of states that are seen as having very e-bike friendly um, legislation. So, and it really does vary. And then within states, you have agencies that have their own. Bureau of Land Management has an e-bike policy that's different from the states that it's in. National Park Service is the same. So um, there's a lot of confusion, and we're really hoping to get a little more cohesion. And that's where I think the, the class system came in to try to give uh, legislators a, a better idea of how to uh, create something that isn't so confusing. I'll just to add on to that. So even though e-bikes, it's not illegal to ride an e-bike in New York State, um, that hasn't stopped people, has it? No. In fact, we sold, I used to own a shop, we sold our first one like 12, 15 years ago. I went ago. to New York to buy one. I mean, it, it's... <clears throat> So that's one. The other one is um, the Philadelphia Zoo has e-bikes for being on their ground. That's private property. The Montgomery County Parks and Recs, I'm talking, these are customers of ours, right. have bought e-bikes with throttles to monitor the, the trails in Montco. Right. So they're in use on our trails by our government. So we have, we have time for... We have time for one more question. There is going to be some time. And I don't know if folks. Third, third I, I, one, yeah. Just one moment. Uh, there's going to be some some uh, some time probably afterwards for people to talk to folks individually. I'm available 
uh, to talk individually as well. We have one time for one more question, and then I'll close this out. This was a great topic, number one. I think it, you know, all the discussion, there's some purists, there's some, I'm more pragmatic. I think the most important question is the safety question, and that's, that means speed, okay? And I noticed that the European bike, your European bikes are set up for 15, yeah. maximum speed. Here, it's legal up to 20, okay? The 28 is not legal, so... It's, le it's legitimate and critical to regulate it appropriately based on the safety concerns, which means anything too fast needs to be a street legal motor vehicle, okay? As opposed to uh, regulated and operated as a bicycle. So I think it's, I think, you know, we really have to agree on the safety criteria speed limits, uh, and we do need to have some enforcement. I think it's appropriate to have speed limits on the trails. Well, thank you. I'd, I'd really like to, uh, to thank our panel. Um, in particular, Paul, uh, I, don't, I didn't remember hearing a single question or comment that supported his viewpoint, and I don't know if any of you have ever been in a room where you're the only person in the entire room who agrees with you, but it takes guts to do that. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate the sort of stress test that you bring to this conversation. Yeah. Because I have been on e-bike panels where the argument is over how great e-bikes are, and who thinks they're the greatest versus who thinks they're pretty good. And that's really not that interesting. Uh, I think having a diversity of opinions is really good, and it, it forces us to sort of clarify our positions uh, and, clar and, and really think, well, is that true, and really consider are we thinking about all the possible implications of what we're doing? So I really appreciate you being here. Thanks to the rest of the panel as well. I also want to shamelessly plug our next event in Norristown uh, on November 17th. We're having a suburban bike forum. It's all about biking in the suburbs. It's road networks, low-stress streets, uh, trail connectivity. We're having an e-bike panel where Kimberly will be there as well as uh, Mike Brownlee from Chester County. We're going to have e-bikes in the parking lot and I think we're this close to getting Bird to come on board as well and have uh, e-scooters that people can try out and see what they're all about as well. Uh, I have some postcards up here if anybody's interested in grabbing one of those before they go. But in any case, the rest of us are still available for a few more individual questions. And thank you so much.